Welcome, folks. You also have a question? Yes. So, with regards to the project, do we need the, the next, this lecture, next week lectures, or can we just do it today? And like you're done. You're done. Last week was the all you needed. Because I saw in the old project, Sam Eva, that we didn't learn yet. What, what did, uh, what Eva? part? Uh, Do we learn the old part about Eva? I don't think so. I don't think it's required for the project anymore. Oh, it's not required anymore because I've seen in previous yeah. examples. It's not required. Yeah, previous anymore. project, it's not required for this one. So, so equity option, DCF, and multiples, that's it. And equity option may apply to only like one in 10 companies. So we're actually done two weeks ago in terms of what we needed for the project. I didn't know. I thought there is the other parts. Yeah. Also needed, no, the there's no EVA needed. So you can, you can finish up. In fact, speaking of the project, and since we're starting class, um, if you, you know, as you get the numbers, obviously, let me re you know, reframe what's, gonna, what's left of the class. We have three sessions left. Today, we're going to do acquisition valuation. On Wednesday, we're going to talk about changing value, but that's just working with the DCF and asking what can change when different levers get changed and talking about you know, restructuring and how it changes value. And next Monday, we're going to do kind of a grand finale, bring everything together in the class, you know, kind of in one session. And for that class, I will need your help. And what I will need from you is other, the numbers for your company, your DCF value, your pricing. And I've sent multiple nagging emails about doing this. But if you can enter the numbers for your company, it's six numbers. So it's not a big deal once you've done your project to enter the numbers. It is enter the numbers for your, for your company and your recommendation, buy, sell, or do nothing. And the next Monday's class will be about taking what you found in the class and looking at it relative to what prior classes doing this have found as well. But that'll be next Monday. Your final exam is next Wednesday. So things just pile on top of each other because uh, your final project is due on Monday, your final exam is on Wednesday. And as with the third quiz, I will give you this option for the, because some of you prefer to take an open-ended version of the exam and it's a, it's a trade-off and you've got to decide whether the trade-off works for you. I'll be providing that option again. So are there any questions about the logistics of the class I would, you want me to deal with before we dive into today's session? So everything you need for the project, we've already completed. So all you've got to do is intrinsic value pricing. And if it applies, a real options value. But the crowning glory is you've got to put a recommendation. Would you buy the stock, sell the stock, or perhaps hold the stock? Shreya? Professor, will the final exam um, have a, have the usual 12-hour window? Or will we have just... It'll be a 12-hour window, but it's a two-hour exam. So you got to start by the 10th hour to get done by the, do you see what I mean? Yeah. You no, know, so the exam ends at six, you got to start by four to be done by six, so. Got it, thank you. Yeah, Yossi? Yes, so the final exam again, so to what time you, you're gonna, can we do it in the evening, like six, 7 p.m., you're gonna make it till? Or... I can extend it out, basically, because it's a two-hour exam, the window will be longer, so I, I will try to make sure six or seven New York time. Yeah. Okay. I might, you know, so I'll, uh, I'll, I'll make sure that people have enough time during that day to be able to take a two hour window because I know finding a two hour block in final exams week can be tricky if you have multiple exams piled on top of each other. Right, so it's easier for, for me personally, it's easier if in the evening because I have another exam. Okay. I'll factor that in, yeah. Any other questions? Okay, so do you guys get a chance to look at that, those, the questions I sent you? Even if you didn't, the questions are so easy and mechanical, you can probably deal with them during the course of the class. So rather than have a start of the class test like we do, it's going to be all through this class. I'm going to draw on you because you're going to have a, a test that runs all the way through. And during the course of these tests, I'm going to check you on what I call the seven deadly sins in valuing acquisitions. The first is what I'm going to call risk transference. For the moment, I'm going to leave these opaque because I'm going to come back and give you very specific examples of each of these. But in risk transference, an acquiring company transfers its risk characteristics to the target company in the valuation. The second is debt subsidies, where access to cheap debt on the part of the acquiring company magically starts to show up in a target company's valuation. 
The third is what I call autopilot control, which is you value company at 20% as a control premium, which is what a lot of bankers do and why that can get you into trouble. The fourth is I want to confront this word synergy. It gets used so often in acquisitions. Do we even know what it means? How do you value it? And why do people mess up so much when it comes to valuing synergy? The fifth is I'm going to talk about pricing in the context of acquisitions. You know what's different about pricing in an acquisition? Is your pure group, instead of being other companies in the sector, become other transactions? We're going to talk about what are called transaction multiples and why that's a very bad way to do pricing statistically. What's wrong? You know what a transaction multiples, right? I look at other acquisitions that have been done in the last year or two and draw my pricing from that. The sixth is, is more psychological, which is in a lot of acquisitions, the decision to do the deal seems to happen before the analysis of the deal. And you can't blame the bankers for it. The acquiring company CEO has already decided to do the acquisition and then the whole process rides on it. So the question is, what do we do about that bias? And finally, I want to talk about accountability. The last session, I noted that many acquisitions fail. And many of these acquisitions are multi-billion dollar failures. So you can have a company that will fire a manager for making a $20 million investment mistake but promote a manager or a CEO who makes a $50 billion acquisition mistake. There's no accountability in this process. And I want to talk a little bit about bringing that accountability back. So let's start with the first sin, risk transfer. And so to do this, I'm gonna actually create, no, I'm gonna create a table and I want this to be between you and yourself. What I'd like you to do is as I go through each test, I want you to put a check if you pass the test because it's gonna be a test that each of you will be taking as we go through or if you fail the test. And in the end, I want you to count up the number of times you fail. And here's where it's going to get um, a little painful. You might already have an M&A job lined up. If you fail this test, please turn that job down because we, we have enough damage created in this process already, don't add to it. And if you pass the test, maybe you don't have an M&A job, but at least you can do this more sensibly. So ready? Let's start the game by creating. So you work for the acquiring firm and I come to you with the target company. I'm gonna play the role of the banker along the way. And you have the right to tell me to get out of here, reject what I'm giving you. So I'm gonna stop at each step and ask you some questions. So you've identified a target company. The target company has the following numbers. Revenues of 100 million, operating expenses of 80 million, giving you operating income of 20 million, that's EBIT. Taxes of 8 million, after tax operating income of 12 million. Let's assume the target company will generate this operating income forever. There's zero growth. I'm trying to keep things mathematically simple so that we're not entangled in valuation mechanics. And let's say the cost of equity for this firm is 20%. So ready, Jesse, you're going to be the one who values the firm for me. Company has no debt outstanding. With these characteristics, what would the value of this firm be? I would put 12 over 20% and say, 60. And it looks like there's a lot of missing data, right? I'm not giving you CapEx. I'm not giving you depreciation. I'm not giving you working capital. But what is it that allows you to be able to value the company in spite of the fact that I'm not giving you the numbers you need for reinvestment? What is the clue that kind of lets you get around that, Jesse? Why were you able to ignore? Because normally when you do cash flow, yeah. if you subtract out, why are you able to get skip there's that no step? There's no growth there's no growth, you don't need to. So because it's a zero growth firm, you're saying, look, it's a call and it's all equity funded, 12 divided by 0.2 is 60 million. Everybody agree with that? Because that's going to be the base from which we're going to start to play games. So now, so here, you're the acquiring company CFO. Your cost of equity is only 10%. So you're looking at this target company that I just showed you in the previous page. What's the value of the target company to you? Uh, you would divide that operating income by 
point 0.1 then in that case if you do that i will sell you the company and i will run as fast as i can out of the door so uh, i and think I, we also need to factor in uh, the debt or the the industry there's no debt the... yeah, so there's no debt so in this case it's all equity funded so we need but to really, what, what's equity based on the risk uh, of for that industry that the target company is operating in and did i give you some measure of that risk um i gave you a cost of equity for the target company right 20% right right yep and remember that the congolium the kenacord example early on about matching up the right discount rate should be the 20% still the value should still be 60 million but your first instinct was hey i'm going to use a cost of equity it's, and it's not and, and i'm not picking on you this is natural right you're an acquiring company say my equity cost me only 10% I'm going to use that. You know that half of all M and A valuations are flawed right from the beginning because the acquiring company's cost of equity is used to value the target company. You've already lost the game, and here's why: it's not just going to create a mistake; it's going to create bias. Any time you look at a riskier company, guess what it's going to look like to you? It's going to look cheap. Why is it going to look cheap? Because you're taking that risky company's cash flow and discounting back at your company's cost of equity, which is much lower. You're not creating value. You just think you're creating value. You're overpaying for risky company after risky company after risky company, and over time, you're going to destroy yourself as a company. That's what happened to AT and T in the 1990s, and in my view, that's what brought down GE in the long term. Is they did this year. It took a long time to catch up with GE, but any time you use an acquiring company's discount rate to value target companies, you're going to overpay for target companies because you committed a cardinal sin in discounting, which is the discount rate for cash flow should reflect the risk of the cash flows, not the risk of the entity looking at the cash flows. So Sahir fixed himself. So you can give yourself a correct answer on that. Your initial instinct was to use the ten percent, but you can't do that. You can't use an average. You have to use the twenty percent. There's no blended cost of equity or an acquiring company. It's always the target company's cost of equity. As I said, half of all acquisitions commit that error. So you're going to run into a lot of people who do this, and I want you to feel comfortable explaining to people. What's wrong with using an acquiring company's cost of equity? So, is everybody comfortable with that, Matthew? If you had to explain this to a Harvard Business School banker who keeps, you know, trying to bulldoze you by saying, "But I heard in a Harvard case we have to use a cost of equity," yeah? because this is a fight you have to win. Because without it, all of the acquisition process will fall apart. So everybody, let's assume that everybody in the class passed this test. Let's move to the second test. Now let's assume, and Sahir brought this up. What if I borrowed money? Let's assume as the acquiring company, you have access to debt. Why? Because you've been around a long time. You have a high rating. You have low cost debt you can access. Let's assume that the after-tax cost of debt is four percent. You're still planning to buy the target company. But you're planning to use fifty percent debt and fifty percent equity in the acquisition. So D, help me out here. I'm the acquiring company. I'm now going to acquire the target company. Its cost of equity, let's say, stays at twenty percent. But I'm going to use half of the capital I need on this acquisition, and that half is costing me only four percent because I have a lot of debt capacity and I have a really low cost of debt. What's the value of the target company to me now? If work, let's work through this mechanically. What's my cost of capital if I just plug numbers in? Uh, so it's uh, should be a weighted average of twenty percent. Twenty and four percent, fifty-fifty, right? So it'll be twelve percent. If I use a twelve percent cost of capital, I come up with a you know with the same cash flows I had before. Remember, it was you know the cash flows I had were twelve million. Twelve million divided by twelve percent gives me a hundred million. This is magic. I've created a forty percent increase in value. But where's the increase in value coming from? It's coming from the fact that I have access to debt at a really low cost. 
And how do you get that access to debt? It really quite because for the last hundred years, I've run my company carefully. I've built up this really stable company. And now what am I doing? I'm taking that cost of debt, bringing down the cost of capital and paying a premium for a target company. So let me draw on a rule in acquisitions that it's well worth remem re remembering. Render unto the target company that which is theirs and not a dollar more. And let me explain what I mean by that. If I pay a $40 million premium on this acquisition, I am rewarding them for something that they absolutely no role in creating. They didn't give me a AAA rating. They didn't spend the last 60 years building a stable business. Why am I paying them a premium? This is almost a universal mistake in acquisitions that I see where the acquiring company's cost of debt is plugged into. I actually saw an acquisition valuation where the banker used an after-tax cost of debt for the acquiring company to value the entire target company. That's it, after-tax. You know what the after-tax cost of debt looks like, right? 2%. And I remember asking, what the heck are you doing? And he said, but we're borrowing all of the money for this acquisition. You see where this logic leads you, right? You're borrowing all of the money. 100% of the capital comes from debt. It costs us only 2%. Of course, your cost of capital is going to look low. But think of why you are able to borrow the 100%. It's because you're a nice, safe company with an excess debt capacity. You use that to borrow the 100%. You can't go around paying premiums based on that cost of debt because you're going to end up giving to target companies huge subsidies for things that have absolutely no role in creating. So when you do a cost of capital for a target company, you cannot just plug in your debt, the, the, what you plan to use is debt on that acquisition and the cost of debt that you have as an acquiring company. Because if you do that, you're gonna end up overvaluing the target company. So if you're wondering why so many acquisitions go wrong, already you can see the root of the problem. You're using the wrong company's discount rate, the wrong discount rate, everything else is gonna blow up on you. which brings me to control. Now, remember that experiment we ran right at the start of the class where I put a three by five card, with the word control and say, how much would you pay as a premium? And I did that cynically because that's what you see in acquisitions is bankers often paying a premium. So let me play the role of a banker. Remember, so you fought me on the first two steps. You kept me at 60 million. I tried skip pushing in the acquiring company's cost of equity, but you said, no way. I tried using your cost of debt and you said, no way. So I'm stuck at 60. And there's no way this deal is going to happen at 60. I've got to get you to pay a premium. So I try an easy one. I said, look, you're an acquirer and acquirers need to pay a 20% control premium. And you say, why 20%? And I give you this historical data from a database called MergerStat. MergerStat is this database that has every M&A done in the US going back decades. So you know what I do? I look at the database and say, over the last 40 years, when you look at acquisitions, the price paid on acquisitions is roughly 20% higher than the market price before the acquisition was announced. That premium must be for control. We'll come back and contest that notion later. That must be for control. And if that's what acquirers have had to do historically, that's what you have to do. That is the basis for the 20% control premium is that's what people have done historically. So come back and kind of stress test that. But if I did that, the 60 becomes 72, right? 60, 60 million plus 20% is 72 million. What do you think of that historical behavior argument? David, do you, do you think it has the data is the data. Clearly, there's a 20% premium that people have paid historically. What's wrong with calling that a control premium and attaching it to every acquisition I do? I think maybe I'm reading ahead to the next piece, but we, we don't necessarily know that it's for control. It could be for, um, you know, it could reflect different different assumptions, like the ability to run the company better. Or, or and if synergy exists, it could be for yeah. control. It could be for synergy. It could be for stupidity. Right? If you overpay, guess where it goes? It goes in the 20%. There's a selection bias, which is if you look at what people pay, it's going to show up as a premium. So even if you accept that the premium is 20%, how the heck do you know it's for control? But here's a much more intrinsic argument against it. Control of what? Oh, the target company. And what are you going to do at the target company? 
or maybe change the way it's run, right? So let's talk the real value control. Let's assume that if you ran the target company, you would run it much more efficiently. Remember the margin that the target company had was 20% pre-tax. They made 20 million operating income on a hundred million dollar revenue. Let's say if you ran the company, you'd cut costs, you'd be more efficient. Your margin would be 30% instead of 20%. Neil, what's the value of control in this case? I don't know whether he's there. Yeah. Sorry. What would be the value of control if you ran the company and you could deliver a 30% margin? Um, let's work through the numbers. Your revenues are 100. 30%. Yeah. So let's, so the revenues right are hundred million, right? So with 30% margin, your pre-tax operating income would become 30 million instead of 20 million. Your after-tax operating income would be 18 million instead of 12 million. And even if you get everything else fixed, your value of the company would go from 60 million to 90 million. You see why? Because basically you're increasing the after-tax operating income by 50%. It's a 50% control premium. Why? Because you think you can cut costs enough to improve margins. This is where I'm going with this, right? If you want to talk about control, I'm going to ask you how efficiently is the target company already run? If your answer is it's already perfectly managed and perfectly run, the discussion is over. What's the value of control worth? Nothing. Because if it's already perfectly managed and perfectly run, what the heck are you going to do with this company that increases value? But if it's not perfectly managed and perfectly run, I'm going to put you on the spot and say, tell me what you do differently. Don't just tell me you cut costs. Cut costs where? Based on what? And then we can talk about the value of control in this company. It'd be based on the change in value. So we'll actually on Wednesday talk explicitly about value how much changing the way a company is run can do to its value, but the value control cannot be a buzzword. It cannot be 20% for every company and it cannot be arbitrary. And the 20% to me is completely arbitrary. It has to be based on looking at what you would do differently at this company. We are cutting managers a lot of slack here by letting them pay a control premium without specifying what they will change at a company. And actually, I think it'd make for better acquisitions because for you to deliver on that, you've got to plan for it. To plan for it, you actually have to show me that this is what you thought you would do. At least this way I can hold you accountable. It serves managers well to be, to be fuzzy. Say, look, there's control, but I can't tell you where. Because then I can track them and say, did you do that? So don't pay 20% control premiums, 30% for some. In fact, in general, avoid arbitrary premiums because those premiums, even if they're based on history, don't measure what they claim to measure. Any questions on the control premium? Now let's talk about the magic S word, synergy. Every acquisition you're at the synergy, so easy to say. So if you think about synergy, you're saying that combining two companies creates an entity that's more valuable than the two companies standing alone. The essence of synergy is the two companies put together are able to do something they could not have done as standalone companies. So let's think about where synergy comes from. It can come from, if you're thinking about an intrinsic valuation, it can either show up in the cash flows or it can show up in the discount rate. You know how many synergy arguments are here, which are discount rate arguments? Let me try one on you, and you tell me whether it makes sense. So Naeem, I am going to do a merger, and I'm claiming this synergy. And I tell you that by combining these two companies, we're going to create a safer company, less risky company. Therefore, the discount rate should go down. Now, let's take that argument in two parts. Can combining two companies create a safer company? Absolutely. You know why, right? Because last session we did option pricing. Remember combining two companies if they're not perfectly correlated will create a combined company that has more stable earnings. So it seems like pretty reasonable, right? But why, what's the danger of going from there to assuming the discount rate will also be lower? So the discount rate actually 
would uh, depend on the variability of returns as well as whether or not the two stocks are moving together versus separately. Right. Let's go back. How do we get cost of equity, cost of cap for all our publicly traded companies? What's the measure we use to come up with it? A beta, right? And what kind of risk does beta, beta measure? Beta measures the risk uh, you uh, cannot. Market spread. risk. Yeah. Market risk, right? And what's the risk you eliminate yeah. when you bring two companies together? What's the risk that you're taking, removing from the process? Um, idiosyncratic risk. Idiosyncratic I don't know whether risk, that's right? the right term the or company not. Company specific risk, firm specific risk. So the risk you're eliminating when you combine two companies is company specific risk. You can't change your beta. You can't. So you take two companies with beta one, you combine them. Guess what the combined company's beta is? It's going to be one, no matter how uncorrelated the two companies are, because beta already focuses on the risk that cannot be diversified away. So the first flaw in the safer company argument is you're right, it's a safer company, but the risk you eliminated could have been eliminated by any of your investors by just holding the two stocks in your portfolio. I'm not going to reward you with a higher stock price for just doing that. Someone stayed up front that when there's synergy in a merger, and I believe there can be synergy, it almost never shows up as a lower discount rate. It's usually going to show up in the cash flow. Synergy is usually a cash flow effect. There are a couple of exceptions, and I'll talk about them. But most of the time, if you're talking about synergy and you really mean what you're saying, it's going to show up as a cash flow effect. So when people talk about potential growth going up, you're a development market company buying an emerging market company. You talk about how you're going to be able to sell more of your products in that emerging market. You're a US company buying an Indian company. The consumer good business in India is huge. Hey, there's a basis for that argument. So already when people make arguments of synergy, about a third of the time you can dismiss the argument right up front because they're going to give you this you know, this, uh, this run about, hey, the discount rate is going to go down because the com company is safe. And that argument already is a flawed argument. But if they want to talk about growth rates or cutting costs or economies of scale, I'm willing to listen because there is synergy. Let's say there is synergy in a merger because there's higher growth and lower costs. You come up with a value synergy of, let's say, 50 million. So now I'm going to come back to you. So you valued synergy at 50 million. As the acquiring company, would you be willing to pay the 50 million as a premium? Or put differently, if I paid the 50 million as a premium, what have I done? I have incentivized the uh, acquired firm for the risk that I, as a, the acquirer, am bringing into the table. So In other words, you give the, the entire. You give the entire 50 million synergy value to the target company shareholders, right? And by definition, you contributed to the synergy as well. So the question you need to ask is, where is my share of the 50 million? If you value synergy, don't build it into the target company stock price entirely because then you've given away the entire game and all you're going to earn after the merger then, even if you're right about synergy, is a fair market return. Basically, you're going to earn your cost of equity. If the essence of acquisitions is you want to create value, some of the synergy has to stay with you. So let's look at the big picture of synergy. Let's think about where synergy comes from and break it down into all of its pot potential sources. Synergy can either be operating synergy or financial synergy. Let's take operating synergy. It's a more honest form of synergy. And you're going to see why I use the word honest in front of it. Operating synergy can either show up as growth synergies or cost synergies broadly. Cost synergies are the easier ones to value because they show up as economies of scale. You know, when you see this most often is when you see two steel companies come together, two retail companies come together. Because what do they say? They have two distribution systems, two mad. So basically they say because they have economies of scale, you cut your costs. And where is it going to show up? It's going to show up as a higher margin for the combined firm. So you have two firms with 6% margins, they combine. And because of economies of scale, the combined company's margins can be 8%. It's easy to value because you can put in the higher margin, you're done. But synergies can also be growth synergies. 
I gave you the example of a developed market consumer product company buying an emerging market consumer product company. You're saying, why are they doing it? Because there's more growth in that emerging market. It can show up as more projects you can take. It can show up as higher returns on capital in that market because you have stronger competitive advantages. Or it can show up as, so basically it's got to show up somewhere in the valuation as a higher reinvestment rate, a higher return on capital, or as, high, or as a higher growth rate. So operating synergies show up in the cash flows, either as a higher growth rate or as higher margins. But you know that in my estimate about one in three mergers, even if there's synergy, only one in three is the synergy operating synergy. Two thirds of the time, the synergies are financial synergies. And let's talk about the most common financial synergy in mergers. And I describe this as the synergy that should never be talked about. You know what the synergy is? It's by combining two firms, you pay less in taxes. You know why you should never talk about it if that's the reason for your merger? Because the minute you mention that the primary reason for your merger is tax motivated, it's like holding a red flag up to the tax guy and say, come and get me. And he or she will get you. I still remember when Pfizer, six years ago, when you know, we talked about the US tax code, how dysfunctional it used to be. Pfizer was planning to do an inversion. In 2014, US companies faced a significant comparative problem, which is a lot of US companies that had global income were required to pay the US tax rate on all of their global income. So if you earned money in Hong Kong and had a 15% tax rate, and the US tax rate was 40%, you're required to pay the extra 25%, but only when you repatriated that cash to the US. So in 2014, a lot of US companies, especially global companies, had tens of billions of dollars caught up outside the US that they could not bring back because they worried about the tax. It was called trap cash. So one way in which some US companies decided to get around this is by doing what's called an inversion. Anybody familiar with what an inversion involved? What was Pfizer planning to do that would have removed this tax problem entirely for them? Are they going to move their headquarters to Ireland? It's they, technically that was what going to be the end result, but how would you do an acquisition that accomplished that? What were they planning to do? D? Uh, could it merge with, with- They were planning company? to acquire a much smaller Irish company. Remember after a merger, you can pick which company is now going to be the primary company. They were planning to do an acquisition or a merger with an Irish company and after the merger, they would become the Irish company, the primary. I mean, nothing about the business would have changed, but the headquarters would have now gone from New Jersey. So Pfizer's headquarters are in New York, I guess, to, you know. so that's what they were planning to do. But then the Pfizer CEO got on CNBC and I could not believe what he was saying because he made a confession. It was like a public confession out there. He said, we're doing this because we want to pay less in tax. And my reaction is, what's wrong with you? Talk about other things like strategic considerations, China, throwing weapons of mass distraction. You say your primary reason is to reduce taxes. You're going to put a, you know, a, a target in your back. And that's exactly what happened. Is the minute they said that, you know, six senators got up and they said, you can't allow it to do it. We're going to pass laws specifically against it. Pfizer ended up withdrawing the merger because the backlash was too strong. But they did it because it was stupid about the way they framed the merger. There were about 50 to 60 companies that inverted just in 2014. US companies were doing this with Canadian companies, with UK, anybody but US, US company, you accomplished the end game. So you could save on taxes by doing an inversion. You could even save on taxes without an inversion because the extent you're a multinational, you can move income around. So basically, if you think about how you can save tax on acquisition, the money making company buys a money losing company. It's going to be some tax savings in the immediate future. If you can write up the book value of your assets in an acquisition, which you sometimes are allowed to do, you get a depreciation tax benefit. So the first financial synergy is a tax benefit. And if that's a reason, don't even talk about it, but that might be the underlying factor. The second is 
you can have two companies that by themselves were not able to borrow money, not because they didn't want to, but because they ran into a limit. So let's say you have two companies with 10% optimal debt ratios, okay? because they're risky companies, you don't want to get above 10%. You combine the two companies, you do create a safer company. This is one of the few cases where you actually have a discount rate effect because now you can, might be able to, as a combined company, be able to borrow 20%, so the 10% that lowers your cost of capital. This is more likely if you have small, risky companies which can't afford to borrow money by combining or rolling them up. Now, the phenomenon you often see, you could end up with a company that can borrow more and the benefits then come from debt having a tax benefit. There's a third scenario where you could potentially gain in the discount rate. Remember when we talked about valuing private companies, we used this notion of a total beta. In a total beta, what do we assume? That the owner is not diversified and therefore he or she will demand a discount rate to cover all of the risk. If you're a public company buying a private company have already given you an opening, right? Because now you can offer the owner way more than what he or she thought the business was worth. Because remember the public company's value for the same private company is much higher because they can use the market beta. There's a discount rate effect and there the discount rate effect doesn't come from the acquiring company's discount rate being used. It's by using the target company's market beta as opposed to a total beta by saying, look, I'm a more diversified investor. If you want to stay a private company, here's a way acquisitions can help you. You go out and buy other private companies. And as you go into more and more businesses, your total beta will actually decrease because you're creating a more diversified company, higher correlation with the market. So from a total beta perspective, you have a lower total beta. The first step in valuing synergy is you got to put managers on specifics. Say, tell me what synergy you have. Is it operating synergy or is it financial synergy? If it's financial synergy, is it in taxes, in debt ratio, or is it in from buying private companies? If it's operating synergy, is it higher growth or lower costs? Because if you can do that, I can give you the three-step process to value synergy, and it is three steps. If you truly want to value synergy in a merger, Here's the first step. You've got to value the acquiring company and the target company as standalone companies. You can never value synergy by just valuing the target company. You have to value the acquiring company and the target company as standalone companies. That's step one. Step two is pure math. Just add those two values you've got in step one. That'll be the value of your combined company if there's no synergy. Value is additive. And in step three, here's what I'm going to let you do. I'm going to let you take the combined company and throw in every synergy benefit you can think of, higher growth, lower cost, lower discount rate, and value the combined company with the synergy built in. You know what you're gonna find, right? In step three, you're gonna come up with a higher value than what you got in step two. That difference is the value of synergy. Abstract, but let's try this out. So here's what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna go back about maybe 20 years. And Procter & Gamble had just bought Gillette, one of the biggest mergers of all time in the consumer product business. Largest consumer product company in the world, Procter & Gamble, was buying the sixth largest consumer product company in the world, Gillette. Now, I know what plans they had to name the company after the merger, but I'm going to call the combined company that's going to come out of it, Piglet, you know, Procter & Gamble, Gillette. No, but that wasn't the real name. So Procter & Gamble, Gillette, and then you have Piglet. Let's value synergy in this merger because there was a lot of talk of it. So the first thing is I valued Procter & Gamble standing alone. I came up with 221 billion as a standalone company. I valued Gillette standing alone. I came up with about 60 billion. So these are pure DCF values of your standalone companies. Combine the two numbers, I come up with 281 billion. So that's just the combined company, just adding the numbers up. So if there were no synergy, the value of the combined company would be 281 billion. I did a best case valuation of synergy. Saying, what do you mean best case? Here's what I did. I took what managers told me they would do at the time of the merge, merger, assume they would do it, that's the first part, and assume they could do it instantaneously. So for instance, they talked about cutting operating expenses by 250 million, primarily in the advertising realm, because they said, well, two companies, some of the biggest advertisers in the world, the combined company is going to be able to cut costs by 250 million. I'm going to assume that they can do it and that they will do it instantaneously. You know why that's an extraordinarily optimistic assumption? Most companies that claim to cut costs never carry through. 
or they don't carry through the, so you pronounce you're gonna cut costs by 250 million. I'm lucky if you actually cut costs by 150 million. I'm assuming they can cut costs and that they can cut costs instantaneously. So next year when you wake up, costs are cut by, and the, the reason the second assumption is kind of tricky. It takes time to actually cut costs. It takes two or three years. We'll talk about what to do if there's a delay. But if you can cut costs instantaneously, here's what's going to happen. Overnight, your operating income is going to jump by 250 million, right? The pre-tax, because I've cut costs. They did also talk about a slightly higher growth rate. They felt that Gillette was not exactly optimizing its reach in some parts of the world, that Procter & Gamble's know how they could do this better. Not by much, but about a 1% increase in growth rate. So this is a pure cash flow driven synergy, higher growth, lower expenses. The value that I got for the combined firm was 298 billion. There's this canard in finance that in finance we think synergy is worth nothing. That's not true. In fact, I've attached a $17.2 billion value for synergy in this merger with the best case ever. But I'll give you the number that should depress you. You know what? Procter & Gamble actually paid as a premium for Gillette. They paid $25 billion. Now do you see why most acquisitions leave acquiring company shareholders worse off? Even with my best case assumptions, I'm coming up with a $17 billion value for synergy. If you pay $25 billion as a premium, you've already put me $8 billion behind the eight ball. I'm already starting with a negative net present value investment. In fact, my guess is the true value of synergy here is going to be less than 17 billion. Let's see why. Let's assume that the managers are right about the cost cuts, but it's going to take three years for the cost cuts to be delivered. How would I incorporate that delay into the value of synergy? I valued it at 17.2 billion, assuming it happens overnight. But if I had to wait three years for it to show up, Hakan, how would I bring in that delay in this process into my present value calculations? I gave away part of the answer, but it's got to be a present value. Yeah, yeah I would calculate the present value of the cost okay, savings. Now let me put you on the spot. What discount rate should I use? I would use the combined company's discount rate. Combined cost of equity or cost of capital? Cost of capital. You got it. So let's let's start. Let's break it down. Why combine companies? Because when we did the acquisition valuation, we said use the target company's cost of equity and capital. What's different about synergy? Why am I using the combined companies? Because the merger already happened. And the and the for the synergy to happen, the two companies have to come together. So it is the yep. combined companies that generating the benefits. It's got to be the combined company. Why cost of capital? Because I'm looking at valuing the entire firm. So basically this synergy accrues the firm, how much goes to equity and debt we can negotiate, but I'd use the combined company's cost of capital. If the combined company's cost of capital were 9%, 17 billion discounted back three years and 9% would give me like 15 billion. Something to factor in, I, you, know, you know, because in mergers it often takes time, even if synergy exists for it to actually show up. Any questions about the, the Gillette Procter and Gamble example. Okay. Let's do a second example. Let's assume that your merger is driven by tax benefits, not glorious, but we know it can be substantial. And this is an old example, so it might be laughably bad in hindsight. They're your Best Buy. They're the last brick and mortar electronics retailer left standing. You've been approached by investment bankers trying to sell you Zenith. You know, the only thing Zenith had going for it? Lots of losses. The brand name was gone. Nobody cared about it. I mean, I'm sure most of you have never seen a Zenith TV unless you go to a dump and see some 30-year-old TV. But they used to have a brand name. It's all gone. So all you're getting is a net operating loss of $2 billion. So basically, you've got a shell company with a big NOL. Now, this is going to give you a tax guy all kinds of headaches because the IRS doesn't like it when you do it. But let's say you can pass all those little tests for the IRS that the IRS requires. If your tax rate is 36% as Best Buy and you're buying a company whose only asset is a $2 billion NOL, what's the value of synergy from tax savings 
on this. Brian? I got you. Sorry, you got go ahead. Oh, no. <laughs> um, so if I assume it's 40%, then I could have a tax savings of 400 million over the course of a few years. No, but assuming it's, you know, but if you have enough income right now, you could claim the entire tax savings right now, you'd get 720 million, right? 36% of 2 billion, if you think about 2 billion, 36%, okay. you could say. So if you had enough income right now, you'd get 720 million, which is what most bankers do. If you ask them to compute the price, they take their net o NOL multiply by the tax rate. But I think you pointed out a problem. For that to be true, you have to have enough taxable income this year to claim. But if you had only a half a billion in taxable income, you're going to be spreading these savings out over four years, 180 million year one, 180 million year two, 180 million year three and four, because each year you're going to be able to claim some tax savings. We're not quite done. We need a discount rate for these tax savings now. So on this one, what should I use as my discount rate? Because in the previous one, you used the combined company's cost of capital. What's the right discount rate to use on this $180 million every year for the next four years? You can use the target because it's their risk that's generating this loss. Is, is it though? What's the only variable here that you're uncertain about? The NOL is given, right? What's the only thing you're uncertain about is whether you as Best Buy have taxable income. Zenith is a dead company. There's nothing there. Your uncertainty is about your taxable income. I know this sounds like you're changing the rules as you're going along. What you're looking at is where is my risk coming from? And the risk here is, I don't know what my taxable income will be as Best Buy. The discount rate therefore has to capture the risk in that taxable income. Have I given enough clues to lead me to the, lead you to the end? So it has yeah, to be so Best, Best Buy. Buy's cost of equity or cost of capital? Uh, cost of capital. I can live with cost of capital, but if it's taxable income, which is after interest expenses, okay, this is a place where you could use cost of equity and essentially say it's a taxable income I'm uncertain about. So here's my suggestion. Anytime you ever have an issue with discount rates, always go back to the source. Where's my risk coming from? Think about that risk, and that's going to give you clues as to what the right discount rate is. Shreya? Um, I, I know you said you're all right with the cost of capital, but I, I was just wondering why cost of equity, because um, your, the, the amount of interest discount you get will depend on your taxable income. So somewhere a post-tax debt rate and in a post-tax interest rate will let, let, Let's assume that. that you're a company with, um, with a lot of debt, right? Hmm. So your taxable income is going to swing around more because you got to make the interest. So act like you take two scenarios. Let's say Best Buy had not done this acquisition versus doing this acquisition, right? So the taxable income is going to be after interest expenses. Mm -hmm. So we have a lot of interest expenses, the equity. So the rationale there is my risk is far greater because I have debt because my equity income is going to swing around more. And because the NOL tax benefits are going to accrue on the taxable income, Got so it. it's, a, it's really a kind of convoluted way of getting that. But that's why I said I could live with the cost of capital because you could, you know, it's, it's kind of a messy thing to do just cost of equity. But if it's a true risk measure, the cost of equity is probably the more direct measure of risk. Mm -hmm. So can you value synergy? Of course. Okay. Do you have a follow-up question, Shreya? No, okay. So here's my bottom line with synergy. If people talk about synergy, be the skunk at the party. Or be the only sober person in a party where everybody else is drunk. They're all drunk on the deal. Be the person who asks questions about, okay, I accept the synergy. Where is the synergy going to show up? Is it going to be higher growth? You want to get specifics. You want to value synergy. Because if you don't, it becomes a plug variable that explains away whatever you want to do. Now let's talk about pricing and acquisitions. All this in the first four examples, we acted as if intrinsic valuation was what drove your acquisition decision. But let's face it, in acquisitions, we're in a pricing game. So the banker says, forget about this DCF stuff. Nobody uses it. It's an academic exercise. We use multiples here. And he says, typically in this sector, people pay five times EBIT. Remember, I said pricing, your target is this small. What part of that statement can you take issue with? because that's what people pay you say, that's what I have to pay as well. Five times EBIT here would give you a hundred million because your EBIT was 20 million. 
Are you okay using pricing and acquisitions as an acquiring company? What do you think, Lucy? Do you think it's a good idea for acquiring companies to use pricing to value target, to put a number in a target company? Um, no, I don't think so. Tell me why. Um, because if you use uh, pricing, then you're doing... Exactly. Uh, Let's stop at the few years. Why do traders get away with pricing? What's their end game? They buy at a low price and they'll sell at a high price. When six months, a year from now, if you're a trader, pricing makes sense. But if you're an acquirer, what are you doing? You're buying the cash flows of this target company, not for the next six months, but essentially forever. If there was a place where intrinsic valuation should be used, this is it, right? Because the but he's saying, so why do they use it? Who uses it? The acquiring company doesn't. It's the bankers who do. So why do bank? So if you're a banker, do you see why pricing makes sense to you? What's the end game for a banker? You want to get the deal done. What do you care about cash flows in perpetuity? It's not your problem. So bankers are going to push you down this pricing path six times EBITDA, 10 times earnings, two times book value, three times revenues. And if you push back, They'll say, oh, you okay, I see you, you're a believer in DCF. They'll give you this look of content, okay? But what if I just made the terminal value five times that? But you're okay with that, right? I hope after this class you're not because pushing it into the terminal value is just making for this charade where it looks like you're doing a DCF, but your biggest number is still five times up. There's no place if you're an acquiring company who truly cares about value from an acquisition for pricing. But you're going to see very quickly why the pressure will be there for you to use pricing because all of the deal makers make money in the deal getting done. But a lot of acquisition valuations, you'll see pricing. And you'll see a sample composed of other companies that have also done acquisitions. I'm going to come back and talk about the sampling bias here. But as a banker, I'm getting very frustrated with you because I'm trying to get you to sign on to the deal. But at every step, you come back with reasonable things. I wanted to use your discount rate. You said, that's not right. I have to use the target company. I tried to, do, get, try to get you to use a low cost of debt and a lot of debt. And you said, no, no, that's my debt, not the target companies. I tried to make you pay a 20% control premium. But you said, no, I don't do that. I don't see much I can change in the company. I tried to get you to do this acquisition because of synergy, but then you said, I don't see much cost savings, much growth increase. So I hit you with what I think is going to be my biggest selling point. I tell you, look, if you do this deal, it's going to be accretive. This is one of the most dangerous words invented in finance, accretive. Sean, what does that mean when a, when a banker says a deal is going to be accretive? What is it? It's going to add value to the firm. Oh, I wish it did, right? A creative actually is based on a much simpler metric. It, 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 eventually it might, but what's the metric that they use to decide whether something is accretive or diluted? Because those are the two words that are flip sides of each other. Add uh, equity value, equity? I think you think, I mean, I think you're thinking too reasonably. Think like a banker. More money, revenue? It's earnings per share. An accretive deal will push up your earnings per share. A dilutive deal will push down your earnings per share. When not, way out in the future, next year. So an accretive deal will push up your earnings. So it's amazing how many deals get done based on this pitch. It's accretive. And how many deals don't get done if it's dilutive? So let me ask you a question. What is it you will need to do as an acquiring company to make it more likely that your deal will be accretive? Kyle, you want to try? What, what would you need to do as an acquiring company for a deal to be accretive? Just think in terms of pure math. You want your earnings per share to go up yeah, after the deal. Decrease the number of shares by buyback? Or, or, or in this case, at least don't increase, in stock. Or at least don't increase the number of shares, right? If you borrow money to do an acquisition, almost automatically you have a greater chance of this deal being accreted than if you don't borrow the money. That's kind of a silly rule already because then any deal driven by debt is going to be a good deal because it's accreted. Now, the other thing you need to do is buy companies with PE ratios lower than yours. This is a pure math. If you have a company with a PE ratio of 50 and you buy a company with a PE ratio of 25, even if you use all equity, 
your earnings per share will go up after the deal because think of what you've just done. You bought a low. So if you're a company like Netflix trading at 60 times earnings, almost every deal you do, even if you use shares, is going to be creative. So let's think about what's wrong with pricing in acquisitions. The first is the samples you're using are biased. Think of why. You picked other acquisitions, right? And you're trying to decide how much to pay based on what other acquirers are paid, as opposed to what, as opposed to at least traditional pricing, look, looking at what investors collectively are paying for stocks like yours. Here you're looking at what acquirers are paying for stocks like yours. You're saying, what's wrong with that? What's wrong is acquirers, we know historically, have tended to overpay. How do we know? Look at all the research, McKinsey, the KPMG research. You're essentially taking practices that you know haven't worked, and you're trying to do the same thing, hoping for a different outcome. If you want to do pricing and acquisitions, at least do an honest price. You know what that means? You want to acquire a price a steel company for me to acquire? Look at all steel companies. Don't look at the six steel companies that have been acquired over the last three years. And everything we talked about in the context of pricing plays out in acquisitions or control for differences in growth and risk and payout. Do pricing right if that's your end game. Don't do this transaction multiple crap and pick and choose the multiple that gives you the highest number, which is effectively what will happen if you turn this process over to the deal maker. They'll find a multiple that works, that justifies the acquisition, and they'll get a sample that justifies it as well and push you to do the acquisition. So don't be a lemon. Just because every, you know, everybody else does pricing doesn't mean you have to do it as well. And if you're going to price a target firm, base it on all the firms in that sector, not just other transactions. And finally, if I had my druthers, I would remove the words accretive and diluted from M&A language, because I think it's extraordinarily destructive to let it stand in for a deal. And Sean, I think, went to the final point, which is you want something that measures what will happen to my value as a company. And what you're doing instead is focusing on what will happen to earnings per share next year. You know, McKinsey actually did a study of acquisitions based on whether they were accretive or dilutive. And actually, they broke down deals on accretive and dilutive. And guess what they found? Dilutive deals actually turned out in hindsight to be better deals than accretive deals. And that didn't surprise me in the least because accretion and dilution is completely a function of who you acquire and how you fund the acquisition. So at this stage, you're like a rock. Everything I throw at you, you're stopping. So I hit you with what I think is my trump card. Say, so you know what? I know you're one of these intrinsic value people. You seem to want to do the sensible thing. But I have to tell you, your CEO really, really, really wants to get this deal done. Remember, you're the CFO of the company or somebody in the finance group. you have be throwing up all these technical things. You think you're winning the game. And as a banker, I say, you think you're winning the game? Well, you see, you really want to get the deal done. In fact, you know, a, a, we can have investment bankers lined up who will sign a fairness opinion that this target company is worth 100 million. So not only can you get the deal done, you'll also get protection against any kind of lawsuit that emerges from this deal falling apart, because that's what a fairness opinion does. Do you think this might affect what you as a CFO or somebody in the finance group does. If you know your CEO really, really wants to get the deal done, you know what's going to happen to you if you keep digging your heels in, right? You're going to be moved. Move gently or not so gently out of the way because this deal is going through no matter what you do. I want to talk about how much bias is created in this process because CEOs decide what they want to do and then the decision percolates down. This, this isn't some objective process we think, is this good for the company? It's being driven so much by top management already making the decision. And in some cases, will be posed as a defensive deal, which is if we don't do it, somebody else is going to do it. In other words, your Walmart, you're looking at a company saying, Google, we have to do it. You know why Walmart bought Flipkart for 21 billion? Flipkart is the Indian online retailer. 21 billion was this extraordinarily high price for a company that not only was not making money, but had plans to never make money. It was a terribly structured company, but Walmart paid 21 billion. You know why they ended up paying 21 billion? 
because Amazon let out a rumor that they were interested. And I think it was deliberate. They put out a rumor that they were interested in buying Flipkart and Walmart said, we can't let Amazon do it. And Amazon in this rumor mill was kept pushing up the price. So Walmart actually kept bidding up against a non-existent comparative bidder and ended up paying 21 billion. These are called defensive acquisitions and the history of defensive acquisitions has not been good. Because if you keep doing defensive acquisition, you know you're paying too much, but you're saying, if I don't do it, my competitors will. My reaction is just let them do it and destroy themselves. Why are you destroying yourself? to get ahead of them. So at this stage, you can see why deals end up pushing through is because egos get involved, CEOs get involved, nobody wants to back down. You worry about what the competitors will do and you're gonna to start to bend the numbers. You're gonna find a way to use a 10% cost of equity, the acquiring company. You know you're breaking the rules when you say, you know what? It's one deal, it's a small deal, it's not gonna break me. You use the cost of debt, why? Because mechanically you can get away with it and this lets, makes your life so much easier if you can get on the same page as the CEO. You can see why the process is broken. Acquisitions are top down. Somebody up top makes the decision to do things and then it flows through. And when things are top down, the decision's already been made by the time it gets, you're the grunt person in the finance group looking at this acquisition, the deal's already been decided. What they want you to do is make sure that you're on board. And if you're not, they're gonna find somebody else who get on board. The process is screwed up. So just to give you an example of how bad deals take on a life of their own and entangle about, um, HP has this history of horrifically bad top management decisions. So about 12 or 13 years ago, HP buys a company called Autonomy. Autonomy was a UK based, uh, it's a software slash you know, financial services company. And HP was paying you know, $11.1 billion to buy Autonomy, which had a market. So it was paying almost 100% premium on the market price. In fact, the market price was about 5.9 billion. They were paying 11.1 billion. And people were shocked they were paying. Even people in the acquisition business thought they were paying too much. So HP put out a document to justify why they were paying 11.1 billion. And here's how they built up to it. They started with the pre-deal book value of equity, which is book value. They brought in a bunch of accountants to reassess the value of autonomy's book value. So this is the fair value dance that accountants do. They come in and say, this looks more valuable. And at the end of the dance, they'd made the 2.1 billion to 4.6 billion, magical accountants. The market was already attaching a premium to it. So they said, market's paying a premium on this book value. And then they paid a 5.2 billion premium on top of that claiming that there was all kinds of synergy in this deal. They got 11.1 billion and it looked like, so they put out this document, look, the 11.1 billion is justified. At that time, HP CEO, CEO is a guy called Leo Potnikar, a guy who should never have been allowed to become a janitor, let alone a CEO of a company. So this guy shows up in New York at a, at a con he'd, he'd actually replaced this guy called Mark Hurd, who was the previous CEO who had to resign because of some, some kind of a sex scandal. Now do you see why you would never trust HP with any of your cash and CEO after CEO, one bad guy replaced by another bad guy. So Leo shows up at, uh, at a group of equity research analysts meeting in New York. And this was one of those few cases where equity research analysts were skeptical. I think this deal sounds like it's overpriced. Why are you paying? And I'm going to read exactly the words that Leo used with the equity research analysts because I don't want to be accused of putting words in his mouth. He said, we have a pretty rigorous process inside HP that we follow for all our acquisitions, which is a D.C.F based model. Somebody should have stopped and asked, can you expand on that acronym? I'm not sure you'd have known what D, C, and F stood for, but he said, we have a D dot C dot F based model. Okay. In reference to discounted cash flow evaluation, a standard valuation methodology. Okay. And we try to take a very conservative view. So he's doing a D dot C dot F and he's being very conservative. That makes me feel a lot better already. And then he continued, and this is where it gets deadly. It's just to make sure everybody understands autonomy will be on day one. 
accretive to HP. That's the magic word thrown in, right? Accretive. So basically, it must be a good deal. It's accretive. Just take it from us. We did this analysis at great length, in great detail, lots of greats flo floating around, and we paid a very fair price for autonomy. It'll give a great return to our shareholders. Three greats piled up on top of each other. A year later, and this is one of those deals that came apart really fast. HP wrote off almost eight and a half billion dollars on this deal saying, hey guys, we screwed up. Now this is gonna be really difficult to explain, right? Last year, you put out this report explaining why you paid 11.1 .1 billion. Now you gotta explain why it's back down to 2.3 billion. So here's what they did. They blamed first the accountants at autonomy who they said had committed accounting fraud. They said it's, it's the uh, autonomy's numbers were not good. They, no. So they blamed, um, I think the culprit was Deloitte. Deloitte was the accountant for autonomy. They said Deloitte was screwing up the numbers and we got food. But by this time, a new CEO had come in. The new CEO said, you know what? It's, um, uh, it's not uh, my fault. It's Leo Apotheker's fault. He was never very bright to begin with. So I think some of it will write off. But so what I did when, in fact, when they did the write off is I decided to assign blame. And there's lots of, when you have an eight and a half billion dollar mistake, there's lots of people to blame. One was Leo Apotheker clearly screwed up as the CEO of the acquiring company. If you think Deloitte was screwing up the books, maybe Deloitte is responsible for some of it. Now, autonomy's managers are not off the hook either. The bankers clearly are doing the best. So basically, I took the eight and a half billion dollars and allocated the mistake across multiple players. Now, in any fair world, if you made an eight point eight billion dollar mistake, there should be consequences, right? So I'm sure Leo Apotheca returned all the bonuses he received as a CEO. Not. I'm sure Deloitte returned all the accounting fees that charged autonomy, not. I'm sure the bankers all returned. I mean, what did you get paid for? I mean, what was this for the advisory fees to do that terrible acquisition? Should be returning, they should return. I'm sure they returned the advisory fees. Okay, not. This is the problem with acquisitions. You make horrifically bad mistakes but nobody seems to bear, the, it's, it's not my fault, it's that guy's fault, it's the accountant's fault, everybody passes the buck. That's a pretty depressing picture of painted of M&A, right? So let me close on potentially a brighter note. Say you end up going to work for a company that is dead set on growing through acquisitions. So you remember this class, say, oh my God, I should maybe find another job. This company. Let's say though that you want to be a productive part of this company. You want to take that desire to grow through acquisitions and at least improve your odds. So I'm gonna ask you some questions about where your odds are better of creating value as an acquiring company. Would you rather be a sole bidder for a target company or be in a bidding war? Let's start easy. What do you think, um, Sergio? Sole bidder or bidding war? Uh, if I'm an acquirer, sole bidder. Absolutely, right? If you're on eBay, you want to be the only person bidding for something and hope that nobody ever shows up. Second, and this one, Dave, would you rather be bidding for a public company or a private business? Probably private business. And tell me what it is about a public company that makes winning so much more difficult. I think just because like the financials are, are out there in the open where it's private companies and, are more opaque. And for to buy a public company, you have to pay a market price plus. Yeah. So the market already has pushed up the price. I've got to pay a premium on top of that price. Your chances of winning are better in a private company because at least you negotiate the value and you can talk about a premium on that value. Would you rather, and this is a tricky one. I'm not sure it's going to be easily choosable. Would you rather pay with cash or pay with your shares? Yossi, what do you think? You're an acquiring company. Which do you think, think gives you a better chance? Depends if your stock are overpriced, then I'll buy with the okay, stock. Okay, so you're, you're saying if my stock is overpriced, and that makes complete sense, right? I'd pay with shares. We're going to talk about a little game theory here, which is when you announce you want to pay with your shares as a target company shareholder, what do I see? I see you wanting to pay with your shares. And if this is a game theory word, what do I think? Oh, you must 
your shares must be overpriced. So we'll talk about this little game that goes on. You're trying to pay with shares. I'm trying to adjust the premium based on what you're paying. We'll see what ends up happening at the end. Would you rather go for a small target or Hendrik, what do you think? Would you rather go for a small target, small relative to you, you know, or a large target, a merger of equals? Where do you think the odds of winning are greater? Uh, odds of winning, I think I'd rather go up to a small. History of mergers of equals has not been good. Too many cultural wars happen, it's too difficult to win. And finally, would you rather go for cost synergies or growth synergies? Where do you think the potential value is going to be greater? Courtney, what do you think? Cost synergies or growth synergies? Maybe growth. Growth might give you a higher upside, but it's also more likely that you make up stuff when you do the acquisition. Remember when you do a deal, you, there's a bias. Now, I think value, it's true, growth has a greater upside. Let's see what the, what the actual evidence looks like on all of this. Let's start with, would you rather be in a bidding war or a sole bidder? Sergio pointed out, would rather be a sole bidder? And that's a good choice because we know exactly what happens in bidding wars. This is actually from a study that looked at bidding wars and it looks, looked at the winners and losers of bidding wars. You know how the Wall Street Journal defines a winner of a bidding war, right? If you're the winner of a bidding war, you win the bidding war, you get the target company. So one of these lines is the winner. Don't look at the, the index. And one of these lines is the loser. This is the acquisition date. This is what happens after the acquisition date. You know which one's the winner here? They're the winners right there. The winners see the value drop by 30%. The if you're in a bidding war, pray and hope that you lose the bidding war. Sounds like an odd thing to say. But in auctions, there is this well-known phenomenon called the winner's curse. You know what the winner's curse tells you? If you're in an auction and you win, you should always have mixed feelings about winning. Think of why you won, because everybody else in the room thought you were paying too much. That's the only way you win. And most of the time, guess what? They're right. You won because you paid too much. And in bidding wars, that's what tends to happen. So my advice to companies that want to grow through acquisitions, if you get into a bidding war, drop out right now. Don't play this bidding war because it cannot end well for you because you're going to end up losing a lot of money along the way. It's not worth the effort. It's a very simple rule. I don't know why companies don't make it actually almost autopilot. You, you bid for a target company, another bidder shows up, you drop out instantaneously. You know why it's so difficult to drop out? We talk, talked about egos getting involved. You're the CEO of a company, another company that is in your same business is bidding for the same target. You don't want to lose and you're gonna win at any cost. And guess what? You are going to win at any cost if that becomes your end game. You're better off buying small companies than large companies. I know this graph is kind of difficult to read, but basically size is relative. I have to define small relative to your company. So if you're Apple, and you're worth $2 trillion. A $50 million company is tiny for you. I mean, last week, for instance, now I think it was, uh, was it Microsoft that did a big acquisition? I think it was Microsoft. But the Wall Street Journal called it a big acquisition. It was a $16 billion acquisition. Only $2 trillion. Think of what a $16 billion acquisition is to you. It's less than 1%. So the way this, this study did it was it looked at the target company's value relative to the acquiring company and broke it down to, was it less than 5%, more than... So basically, if you can go from, you know, the blue is the smallest, the red... So basically, from really small to very big. The big was more than 20%. The target company is more than 20% the size of the other. If you look across the board, the purple is definitely the biggest loser. You'd much rather buy small companies than large companies. But here's the interesting divergence. This uh, study also looked at cash deals versus stock deals versus combo deals versus all. Across all deals, no, you know, clearly small deals are much better than large deals. Like small deals, you actually have a chance of creating value. The blue is a positive. Large deals, huge loss in value. But look at cash. Small deals, you're actually better off with if, if you look at, if you're doing, if, if you're doing across deals, if you're paying with cash, if it's a large deal, you're better off paying with cash. If it's a small deal, you're better off paying with stock. 
And here's why I think, I think it's, it, it makes sense. It's a, it's a game theory problem, which if you're a $2 trillion company buying a $15 billion company, and I pay with stock, there's no game theory involved. You're a tiny company. You can't say they're saying, are they doing it because they're overvalued? Because Apple probably doesn't even think about value for a $15 billion acquisition. But if you're buying a $500 million company and you're a $2 trillion company, that $500 billion company, stockholders think a lot more about, hey, why are they doing it? They're more likely to second guess why a company is using stock. And if they believe it's using stock because their shares are overpriced, it pushes up the premium. The average premium on stock-based acquisitions is about 4 to 5% higher than the average premium on cash-based acquisitions. Why? Because the people receiving the shares have to incorporate the fact that you're more likely to be overvalued. And if you look at different tar types of target based on whether they're public or not, it's no contest. Private company acquisitions create much more value than, much greater chance of creating value than public company acquisitions. But there's a little twist. If you buy divisions of private, of public companies, you actually do even better than buying private companies. So basically, if I had to rank companies, your best potential targets are divisions of public companies. Remember the Tata Motors Jaguar Land Rover acquisition in 2009? When Tata Motors bought Jaguar Land Rover, it was a part of Ford. And you know why Ford got rid of Jaguar Land Rover? Because they were desperate. It was after the 2008 crisis. They worried about you know, their financial standing. And they were so desperate, they, they would have sold Jaguar Land Rover at any price. And they did. They sold at a bargain basement price. So if you're going to do acquisitions, you hope to succeed. You're better off focusing on divisions of public companies and private businesses than on entire public companies. This is what struck me as you know, unexplainable when Disney bought Fox. Do you remember the $65 billion acquisition three years ago? Do you remember what the original rationale that Disney gave was? First is they said they wanted to control Hulu. I said, okay, that makes sense. You want to be in full control of a streaming platform. But why do you have to buy a $70 billion company to get a piece that's worth about a billion or two? Why don't you just negotiate to buy Hulu? In fact, all of the things they talked about as adding value to Disney accounted for about 10 billion out of the 65 billion of Fox's value. They were buying an entire company. It's like buying a house because you like the, the tool garage that you see in the backyard. I, I think this is a little disproportionate. You don't have to buy a $3 million house because you like the $15,000 tool garage in the back. I think Disney could have got everything they wanted without buying the pain that they did by buying an entire company. And finally, if you look at growth versus cost synergies, it's no contest. If you look at the, uh, and basically these are from McKinsey studies that look at the percentage of the time that companies deliver on synergies. If you look at growth synergies, revenue synergies, you see a much bigger likelihood. So basically more than 100% is basically delivering more than 100% of the promise synergy. Look at the number of companies that deliver well below what they claim they would on revenue synergies. And if you look at costs, you can see a much higher percentage of companies deliver promised cost savings. So if you see a merger motivated by cost savings, you're far more likely to see companies be able to deliver on what they promise than if you focus on revenue synergies. So if I were to summarize what you can get from all of these studies as a potential acquirer, somebody wants to grow through acquisitions. The first is that Creating value for synergy is a lot more difficult than it looks up front. All those spreadsheets you create for synergies, this is the first step. You need a plan to deliver and you need to act on that plan. Synergy is not going to deliver itself. And if those synergies are cost synergies, you're more likely to be able to deliver them in the near term than if they're revenue synergies. And you're more likely to create value from these synergies if you're targeting private companies, small companies, divisions of businesses, then targeting an entire public company. And that's the thing about M&A. We know what we need to do to do this better. But we also know that this is not going to happen because this is a process. There's an ecosystem here where too many people are making too much money 
from M&A as it exists now. And there's no incentive to examine whether the process makes sense. And as long as the process makes sense, you're going to end up with bad acquisitions. So my, bo my bottom line is if you want to grow through acquisitions, you need a lot more discipline than if you grow organically. Because even if you succeed in the near term, the seeds of failure are right there as you succeed. One of the most successful acquisition stories of all time was Cisco in the 1990s, a company went from 4 billion to 400 billion, almost entirely by acquiring other companies. You think this is good, it became a Harvard case study by 2002, how to grow through acquisitions. Cisco continued with that same strategy over the following decade and destroyed almost half its value. You're saying same CEO, same strategy, what changed? Cisco just got a lot bigger. It got more difficult for this. If they just stopped in 2000, they'd have been a much more successful company. But the problem is with acquisitions, it's very difficult to be disciplined enough to say, hey, we've run out of steam here. We're not getting the bargains we used to. We're not getting the value created. We need to walk away. So if you see a company announcing a big acquisition, to me, it's a, to me, it's a trigger. I, it makes me rethink whether I want that company in my portfolio. I have Microsoft in my portfolio. If Microsoft announced a $300 billion acquisition of Netflix tomorrow, I'm out of the door. Because a big acquisition historically in many companies is the start of the end of your glory days. Yossi, last question, and then we can end for the day. Yes, you think we'll see a phenomenon um, equivalent to direct listing versus IPO in M&A also? Sort of um, a bypass of this process and a, and a quicker of way? Of bankers, if the management wants it. The problem is this is not just the banker's fault, right? See, it was a lot of bad, bad acquisitions. I think there are multiple people responsible. It's the bankers, it's the management of the acquiring company. The man, There's nobody in that room who wants the deal to be assessed honestly. The people who really care are the people not in the room, right? Shareholders of the company. The problem is I think this problem, ha I think, has deeper roots. You know, one of the most, and I'll end with this, you know, there have been studies that look at what drives the premium paid on acquisitions, looking across acquisitions. You know what the biggest factor explaining acquisition premiums is? The CEO ego and overconfidence. One of the things in behavioral finance we know is overconfidence is one of those con you know, continuing features of human nature that gets us into trouble in investing, in business. And the problem is the nature of how you move up an organization is by being overconfident. Think of those kids in high school that you absolutely, I mean, you absolutely hate these kids. They think they know everything. They act like they know everything. You say, one of these days you're going to meet your end. Guess what? They end up becoming, you know, CEOs of companies because that same overconfidence can, it's overconfidence at the top that percolates through to deal making. Because think of how it shows up. You look at a target company, you think you can pull off the impossible. You're an overconfident person. You're surrounded by overconfident bankers. Even if you all try to do the right thing, you cannot because the overconfidence is going to get in the way. So I wish there were an easier fix, but I think that the only way this process will change is if we've got enough shareholders who can throw their weight when a deal comes through that they can present a counter. I mean, I, think I call this the devil's advocate argument. Somebody pushes for a deal. You need somebody else in that room with enough resources to push against the deal. And until that happens, I think a lot of bad deals are going to go through. Okay, folks, I will see you on Wednesday. And uh, as I said, Wednesday, we're going to talk about the last piece of this packet, you know, about changing value. I'll send you a link to the MBEV uh, SAB Miller blog post I did about six years ago when they, that merger went through, because it'll kind of take you through the mechanics of this process of how do you do this in a real merger? How do you assess control, synergy, undervaluation, all the different motives? So I will see you on Wednesday.